acceptance of the 1%. But I think what we've been hearing lately, uh, ergo the uh, presidential language in the presidential uh, nomination, were that there are a majority of people who have most of the money, and a minority of the people have less of the money. So when I think of the 99%, I think of all of us. And when I think of the 1%, I think of all of them. But in reality, it's not really the true picture of the puzzle. Because the real puzzle is that if you look at us broadly, from a broad base, we have more in common with each other and there's a common denominator amongst all of us if we look at each other and look within ourselves to find that. So while there usually can be language that can be uh, divisive by nature, 1%, 99%, left, right, uh, left wing, right wing, there is more that we have in common to share than it is our differences. So that's my view of the 1% and the 99%. But I really believe wholeheartedly that, as I've always said from the moment that I came to California, that there were only two kinds of people in the world. And that was those who were from Brooklyn and those who wished they were. <laughs> <laughs> I would say 1% are all people from Brooklyn and 99% people who really wish they were from Brooklyn. <laughs> Very good. Reggie, why would I share that point of view? The Great Depression. Why did they come up with Social Security? Well, people were looking for a job and they couldn't find it. The people were, you know, a year out of work, two years out of work, three years out of work, and they were just at the soup kitchens. So they did Social Security. They passed the legislation in case, you know, if you didn't save up enough money or you had a bankruptcy or foreclosed in your house, at the very end of your life, you had no opportunity to remake your money that you had saved, you'd have a safety net. So what are the advantages of getting rid of Social Security? The advantages are, right now a lot of people are thinking Social Security as it's there for them. So they're not saving enough anyway because they're just relying on Social Security. That's one possibility. Also, you know, they talked to previously under Bush of uh, privatizing Social Security. So this was keeping the money, but instead of having the government manage it at a low 3% growth, which was stable, but it wasn't really what you could maximize. If you had it in um, mutual funds, you probably would have made 6% maybe. So you might have made double your money. If you had it in stocks, you might have even made more. You might have made 10, 12% a year. So you could say, are people worse under Social Security where they only have this 3%, maybe they don't have that much money, but they have a, a guaranteed amount, or they want to be really wealthy at the end of their life, but not necessarily guaranteed. They might only have 3% or 12%, who knows? Or they might mismanage it, who knows? So that's the question for you to decide. <laughs> Vote accordingly. <laughs> Okay, let's uh, switch topics a little bit here. Um, have you ever heard the expression, time is of the essence? And what does that mean to anybody? Eric, what does it mean to you? Time is of the essence. Oh. Right now, uh, at Berkeley Law, I'm doing finals, so that's why I missed the last two meetings. Uh, so time is very important for me. Um, I'm spending all day studying for my finals. Um, and I, I think beyond just school, I mean, you always hear people talking about how they wish they had more time to like spend with their children or spend with their family, so I think that's what Kindness of the essence means to me. Okay, uh, expression over my dead body. 
And what does that mean to anybody? Let's see. Lindy? Good morning, everybody. Over my dead body is one of my favorite expressions, I guess. I remember my father using it a great deal. And the idea is, of course, that whatever the other person is saying, you are so much against it that it's not going to happen unless they kill you or unless you die. So I like using it for emphasis because it, it gets, it's, it's impactful. And I think there are a lot of things in life that are prolonged more than I would want them to be. And so, in general, I tend to use it whenever anybody draws something out that I would like to have done much more succinctly. So I would say to them something to the effect of, you need to wrap this up, because if you don't, it's going to be over my dead body. However, when you think of it in literal terms, what would be literally above, over your dead body is, for most people, the soil, the earth. So maybe we should start using it in a more friendly way, that what is really over our dead bodies is life-supporting and stuff that we need, and it's a good thing when we say, over my dead body. <laughs> Um, what does, um, I don't know if I want to prolong this much longer, but, uh, what about, what, what do you think about, um, astronomy? Do you believe astronomy is real, or? Anybody want to comment about astronomy? You mean astrology? Or Astro astrology. No, astronomy, like, uh, you know, with Sagittarius and... Astrology. 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 Know about the character. Suppose someone is Gemini. You can find five Gemini or six Gemini. They have some common, common things. They behave in certain way. You see, entertaining. About the future prediction, uh, I don't know how far it is. But if you think that nobody can predict future, nobody can even analyze the past. But it's a strange thing to know. But it's entertaining when you know about the world and. Uh, and also, I believe in some, uh, the astrology because beyond my physical self, I don't know what is going on there. If I born right at this moment, there, there are some elements. The weather is affecting me, the sun and moon, they are in proper alignment and some stars, and they are also affecting me. Because of that, I have got a unique appearance, a unique behavior pattern I have. It's, everything is connected, if believe it or not. It affects people, and uh, if you trust, it can be so many things. It can be a miracle. If you don't trust, it's just like a stone. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have any experience getting their palm read? What? Your palm read, you know, going to one of these psychologists. Derek? Um. No, but I run into somebody um, like a month ago, and he was like, you have a lucky face. And I was like, oh, I'm like, excuse me. Um, yeah, you have a lucky face. Um, okay, <laughs> um, well, thank you for that. But um, I'm like, what do you mean? Um, so, you know, out of curiosity, although I was a little bit worried because I'm like, who's this stranger asking, telling me all this, you know, nice thing to me. Um, but um, he started like um, asking me, like, how many brothers do you have? And I'm like, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I just think that 
we create our own destiny and um, there are certain things that are meant to happen in our lives but there are certain things as well that um, we're, we are in charge of our own lives. Um, that's very interesting. Thank you. I've never met a genie in the bottle, but I did love my favorite genie in the bottle, Barbara Keene, and uh, I dream of genie. So I guess I'll talk a little bit about that, because I don't know what to say about genies in bottles. Um, I actually have had my palm read. I used to play around with tarot cards. Uh, I am a Sagittarius. We're supposed to be judicious. Uh, and I guess I really don't believe in any of that stuff, even though I have dabbled in it. I don't know if things are meant to happen, if we create our own destinies. I, I, I think those um, crystal balls can be fun. Although I ran into a woman recently, my old next door neighbor, who was telling me about this guy. Oh yeah, the, the warlock of Westboro, who used to live a few towns over from us. And she claimed that he had predicted uncanny things in her life. And he was this local character, and she used to to me, she was just the mom next door when I was growing up. Of course, I didn't think of her as having this whole other life of herself. But it, she, the things that she told me that he predicted really gave me goosebumps and chills. I have a hard time believing it, although it's really fun to entertain those ideas that there are people who can see things about you that you don't know yourself. And... I will conclude by saying, I Dream of Jeannie was a light, fluffy, and enjoyable TV show from my childhood. <laughs> Fellow Toastmasters and Mr. Table Topic Master, a quick decision that I was in and had to make a quick decision to get out is this topic. Yeah. So I will go. Since I can't think of any quick decisions that I made to get out of difficult situations, back to the genie in a bottle. And that's my difficult situation I'm getting out of, talking about the genie in the bottle, which I like a little better. I'm also from Brooklyn, and uh, originally, now from, from Queens, but my parents came from Brooklyn, so I, uh, my roots are in Brooklyn. And if you remember, there are candy stores in Brooklyn. Oh, yes. And... Um, <laughs> I, I was thinking when you talked about the genie in the bottle of an old Lenny Bruce joke. <laughs> Everybody here is probably, some people may not be familiar with Lenny Bruce, but in case you're not, I consider him to be the greatest comedian, not comedian, but social satirist comic that ever lived. And a lot of his stuff was kind of unsayable here. <laughs> However, this, this joke is okay that an old uh, Jewish man in Brooklyn was looking around in his basement, and I'm stealing his joke, but he was looking around for things and he found a, um, a magic uh, a lamp. And the, the, the genie came out. The genie said, I am the magic genie. I can make you anything you want. Just say something, I can make it. He said, make me a chocolate malted. Mm -hmm. He said, you're a chocolate malted. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm kind of embarrassed because it's been someone who I, it's, it's not an unusual person. It's someone many people admire. It happens to be Oprah Winfrey. I love Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey because she has exposed herself and been so vulnerable. Even though she has lots and lots and lots of money, she's used it so wisely. She's used it to help other people. And I just can't tell you how much I appreciate her vulnerability in front of the world, essentially. How she exposes herself. She is a role model to me as far as coming from a very difficult life, overcoming obstacles, 
and helping others, helping herself, making a good life for herself, and helping so many people in the world. Thank you. So who's my favorite celebrity, or who can I think of right now? I think that's what I'm going to go with. I am thinking of Dr. Oz. I don't know whether all of you are familiar with Dr. Oz. He appears on TV, he's talking about different medical, um, I guess, issues or things that people go through. And he mostly focuses on women. <laughs> and I would say most of the people in uh, who, uh, who go for the show are mostly women. And they're usually very excited to meet a doctor. And and I just like the way he uh, talks about different things and he gives advice as to what um, we can all do or, you know, just, <laughs> just different things. And I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Dorothy Kirsten, she was an opera singer in the uh, 50s and 60s. When she came out on stage, this beautiful blonde woman, so wonderful, so nice to the chorus people. When we were waiting off stage, she would always talk to us. She never acted like she was the Queen of Sheba. And she had a way of telling people off. And one thing from the Remini's um, opera, I can't even think of the name right now, we are all ladies in waiting around the beer of the of Dorothy Kirsten's part, Francesca. And in that scene her father in law comes in.